Welcome to the Word Podcast. The Lord God has given us His Word. Let us learn it. Let us live it. Let us rejoice in it. Spread the Word. Blessings, everybody. This is Dale. Thank you so much for joining with me today on the Word Podcast. It's been sort of a wild day here um, locally at the time of our recording. This is, uh, what day is today? Today is September the 5th, 2019. And uh, Hurricane Dorian is sitting offshore of the Georgia-Carolina coast right now. I have a daughter that lives in the Carolinas. <laughs> and so, you know, we sort of keep up with this stuff close. And so I'm sitting there watching, and the outer bands are just wrapping up tornadoes after tornado after tornado. There was one point I was looking at a while ago, there was seven or eight tornadoes being shown by radar in the area where they're at. So it's been sort of a crazy day. So Lord protect them, right? So anyway, uh, we're in the book of Hebrews, folks, and we just finished the eighth chapter of Hebrews. So let's start moving into the ninth chapter. Remember what we saw in the eighth chapter. At the end of it, the last verse said this, that when he said a new covenant, this is speaking of the Most High God. Remember all those quotes from the Old Testament, how he was going to give a new covenant. He has made the first obsolete. So the Old Covenant, the first covenant, has been made obsolete. But whatever is becoming becoming obsolete, notice that, becoming obsolete and growing old is ready to disappear. A lot of times uh, people from the New Covenant perspective want to interpret that as saying that we have no need for the Old Covenant anymore. We don't need to study it. We don't need to examine it. And I, I mean, I'm, I've actually been in several situations where people do not even open the Old Testament. They think, oh, we just, all we need is the New Testament. We don't need to, oh, we don't need to go read it. We don't pay any attention to it. We don't cross-reference back to it. And that is just abject foolishness. That's the only way to describe it. Because you cannot understand what the New Testament is saying and the details of it without looking at what the Old Testament said. And you say, well, why do you say that? Well, look at the example we have before us. In the book of Hebrews right here, full of quotes from the Old Testament. Okay, just, just full of quotes from the Old Testament. And so that really ought to drive your heart to go back to see what's being said and what the context is and what the story is about. And you see it through all uh, the New Testament writings. Uh, quotes from the Old Testament. And a, a little book like Jude, which is, what, 25 verses long, I think? 25, 26 verses long. Jude writes... And he'll sit there and fire off in one verse a thing, then the next verse a thing, the next. And I think there's one verse where he encounters two or three things that he mentions from the Old Testament, which covers chapters in the Old Testament. So we must go back and read the accounts. We must go back and see what God said. You have to know the old with the new, and you must know the new to understand what the old is saying. Okay? So that we need to be real careful of that. Sometimes people, uh, you know, we always swing the pendulum too far. You know how that goes. So he says this, that the old is obsolete and is passing away. Now, remember, there's no chapter division. There's no verse division. Chapter 9, verse 1, just get, that's just the address where we know where we are, says this. Now, starts with the word now, N-O-W. What do you think of when you hear like now in this context like this? What he's saying is, okay, I'm describing this to you. I'm explaining this to you. I'm teaching you about this, giving some insight. Now, so based upon what I just said, you know, and in the context of what I just said, this is what the Spirit is leading the author to say. Based upon all this, now, even the first covenant, that's what he was talking about, the old, the first covenant, even the first had regulations of divine worship and the earthly sanctuary. So he's about to go in to some detail right here. Some would describe as mind-numbing detail. <laughs> it's not really mind-numbing detail. It's just a reminder. Remember the folks he's writing to right here were Jewish in background. They were true believers. They're believers now. They believe that Jesus is the Messiah. But they're really being tempted, some of them, to go back into the old ways in the Judaism. Not necessarily to neglect Jesus but they are by what they're thinking, and they don't know it. That's one of the motivations of writing this, the exhortation that is Hebrews, that Jesus is better. You don't need Jesus plus Judaism and the law and the Mosaic stuff that's all involved with that, keeping the rules and the regulations of divine worship. From back then, you don't need that. And that's what the point he's driving home. So these folks knew this stuff. 
they knew it far better than we can imagine because this was their life, their personal life, and their, the life of the multitudes of generations that had come before. I really don't have any way of, of describing it from a Western mindset of what we live in now day to day to drive home the point of how this was uh, so uh, built into their society, okay, and who they were as a people. For generations, for hundreds of years, actually by this time, thousands of years, okay? So he says, now, folks, he said this first covenant had regulations, divine worship, and earthly sanctuary. Now, verse 2, for there was a tabernacle prepared, the outer one, in which were the lampstand and the table and the sacred bread. This is called the holy place. (laughs) So he's taking them back to uh, uh, divine worship 101 from the perspective of the Old Testament. He's just reminded them. And, folks, this is very, very basic to them, very basic to them. To us, it's very helpful, okay, to understand. Now, all of this is in the Scripture. You can go back to the Old Testament, and there's literally dozens of chapters covering all this right here. And you can dig it out, but this is a great little synopsis. He's reminding them of what the regulations of divine worship was. He's reminding them about this earthly sanctuary. And he's just just describing it to them real quick. And they would have known this, folks. Oh, gosh, they would have known this. So he said, remember, the tabernacle consisted of a place called the holy place. It was an outer temple. And there you had the, the lampstand and the table and the sacred bread. And this the, the tabernacle is just a great study. Verse 3, Behold, the second veil, or behind the second veil, there was a tabernacle, which is called the Holy of Holies. Now, tabernacle just simply means a dwelling place. Okay, it's a, a dwelling place. Come in to dwell with something. So you had this earthly sanctuary. And it consisted of a, a, a tented area that inside was divided into two places. The first place you walked into, he's calling the holy place. The second place was behind another veil, and he's calling it a tabernacle. That is the holy of holies. And I know you've heard that. But quite often people never stop to think, why is it called the holy of holies? Well, <laughs> because the whole thing is holy. But this is the holiest of the holy place. Now, let me read the whole thing right here. There was a tabernacle prepared, the outer one, in which were a lamp stand and the table and the sacred bread. So in the holy place, you had a lamp stand when you walked in. It was over on the left-hand side, I believe. You had a table on the right-hand side that had, the, it's called the table of showbread. It had the sacred bread on it. In front of you there, there was another veil. And behind the veil, there was a tabernacle, which is called the Holy of Holies. Verse 4, having a golden altar of incense and the Ark of the Covenant covered on all sides with gold, in which was a golden jar holding the manna, and Aaron's rod which budded, and the tables of the covenant. And above it were the cherubim of glory overshadowing the mercy seat. But of these things we cannot now speak in detail. (laughs) So he's saying, hey, I can't really get in detail right now. There's one little thing I want to point out right here that people often get distracted. When you look at the Old Testament and you study it and you see what's going on with this whole thing, Verse 4 right here, it says that having a golden altar of incense in the Ark of the Covenant. It sounds like the altar of incense is behind the second veil in there with the Ark of the Covenant. And that's not what you see. A part of this is because the altar here was probably uh, using the Septuagint and, and some things that were said from uh, uh, the translation there. But when you look at the totality of the Scripture, only the Ark of the Covenant Okay, only the Ark of the Covenant was behind the veil. The golden altar of incense was in front of the veil, and here the altar considers it to be a part of that whole Ark of the Covenant veil type of thing because you had to pass and offer incense before you go behind the veil. And that only happened one time a year when the high priest went on, a, in the, on the day of Yom Kippur. Uh, anyway, my time is up. We'll come back and we'll pick this up the next time and look at it a little closely about what it means and especially when he says, hey, I can't talk about it in detail, but I just wanted to remind you of this because there's a point that he's about to make and he's driving home with him. Again, I'm Dale. I'll see you in the next episode.